Welcome to the Weekly Trend, a podcast for navigating the markets through the lens of technical analysis. The Weekly Trend podcast is provided for educational purposes only and does not constitute any professional advice. Listeners should not act upon the information or content without first seeking advice from a registered financial planner. Welcome back to the Weekly Trend podcast. Today is Friday, June 21st, 2024. S&P 500 currently sitting at 5468. I'm David Zarling. I'm here with King of the Hippos, Ian McMillan. Thought you forgot your name there for a bit. Well, you know, I was I was debating on which way I was going to go with your nickname this week. Yeah. I always forgot my own name. Maybe we should have a trivia section on our podcast. Yeah. yeah. One of our teammates was putting out trivia today. Pink milk? Which animal produces pink milk? I don't know. It's hippos. Hippos. I feel like can't drink that. Google says you cannot. It's not consumable. But I think you made a valid point before we jumped on here about this. Like pink milk from hippos not being consumable. Like, haven't we been here before, probably? The first ever person that was like, well, what if we tried to milk the cow? And people just yeah. laughed. They laughed and laughed and laughed. And now and now look at it. Yeah, correct. We got like three different milk. types of cow milk. 2%. Aren't there like three kinds of milk? 2%. I mean, our whole 2% and skim. I mean, but I, I think skim, that's... Skim, now is it, yeah. But I don't know if there's probably a more than that, I would guess. But, I mean, aren't cows just basically field hippos anyway? A field hippo. I, that's what they are. Spotted field hippo. I mean, and we're, and we're drinking their milk. And remember when I think you brought up Henry? What was his name? Henry. What if you were a farmer in Wisconsin and you told people, "Oh, what do you do? what do you do?" Oh, I got about about a herd of 120, 120 head of farm hippos, field hippos out there. <laughs> oh man! But we drink their milk. Are they feeder hippos or see Kevin and I had a debate about this last week when you were gone, the difference between feeder cattle and they're like, uh, we went down the rabbit hole of like all the auction prices. Oh, do you know, Terry Bradshaw, then we ended up on Terry Bradshaw has a whole outfit for like uh, livestock auctioning and horses. Really? Yeah. So he does like big shows. Is feeder cattle considered something that we consume? You buy the calves. Feeder cattle, I think, is the calves you buy. And then it's like two or three years they grow into like... An adult hippo. and Yeah, a field hippo that can be sent off to the butcher. Oh, okay. So it is in the end. You're buying the calves for like a third of the price. I, I think they just go out and eat for a couple years. And they get then you bulk them up. Sure, obviously, there's some farmer listening to us. It's like slamming his computer. Yeah, yeah right. clearly, like... there's more to it <laughs> than that. I'm not trying to like downplay your hard work, but yeah, I think that's how it works. The feeder cattle are like two or three years from being the size to their tiny T bones. Yeah. And then they turn into the T bone. Okay. I mean, it makes sense. And I think. Henry Pasteur made sure that we can get that milk from the cows safely. Although there's some that would argue that you shouldn't pasteurize your milk. I don't really have a strong opinion on that one. I don't. All right. We should probably talk about stocks. We should probably talk about stuff these people care about. Although field hippos and hippo milk, although, you know, Nestle Rabbit also produces pink milk, which is delicious. But here we are. June 21st. Summer is here. Hot summer. Hot summer. Seems like it. I mean, it's getting a lot of publicity. Some type of heat dome. Sounds very fun. Heat dome. Heat dome. Well, you got to market it, man. You got to sell the... Yeah, you got to sell the beer. Just dome of heat. Dome of heat. We've got the longest daylight day of the year going on, so there's a little bit of excitement, but at the same time, like, oh, man, every day from here on out, the daylight gets shorter. Oh, yeah. S&P, I mean, we close right now. It's going to be another green week. NASDAQ closes right now. 
I mean, it's green off the highs. Dow green for the week. Russell, you know, after the last weekly candles, I give Russell some props for hanging in here so far. We got four hours till the market closes, so. Yeah, it's definitely it's keeping the, far, but it's it's keeping the auction process up. We're still above the range or right at the range near 200 on IWM. Yeah. But it still goes to show what, you know, we're talking about all-time highs on all these other indices, but we're still 17% below those highs in small caps. That's There's two ways to view that. Uh, both would be accurate. It's It's been a narrower market. And although some would argue cap weighting is not a breath measurement, at the same time, I think it there might be opportunity here in the future. But until we see an uptrend in a relationship like IWM versus S&P, it's really hard to be. That's really what would be called an opportunity cost. It is. And I keep, you know, I see opportunities, score some runs, but this dude gets on and then gets picked off. I don't know. I don't know what we're doing over here at first base. Every time Russell gets on, he just, he's yeah, thrown out a double play or. I don't know, but he just does. Like last week, we had the massive gap up. What was that, like last Wednesday? Huge gap up. Okay, Russell, here we go. We're on base. And then he get we gave it all back. We're back to where we started. You know, back to 198, 199, 200 on IWM. We'll see. We'll know. We'll know that demand has control if IWM, small caps, Russell 2000 is above 210. 210 is the secret. Yep. X marks the spot. And and that was that neckline, right? We talked about that. That was the big neckline from 2021. Back to the scene of the crime. And it has been a, at least for sure, the last month. And we've seen... I think we're to what? We have one one sector above a relative 200-day moving average. Really? And then it's tech. One sector. We lost communicate there. We had two. We lost communication services last week. It looks like XLE is above a 200-day. It might be. Is it dev now? Yeah. On a, on a relative? Oh, on a relative note. Relative, yes. Got it. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's it's been the large cap show, and I know you and Kevin took time last week to talk about, you know, large cap tech and how centric that has been, and everything else has kind of fallen off, and that's absolutely true. It's been a very narrow market environment. It is interesting that this is – it's both not unexpected and at the same time – is it long in the tooth? You know, this last week was June 18th or 618, which also some would call a Fibonacci day, right? A Fibonacci yes. extension. Yes. I like and, that. And so we've got, you know, Fibonacci, if I guess I could start with, it's the where a golden mean or ratio comes from, but it's a the sequence is a sequence of numbers, 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34, 55. And where am I going with this? Each of those, you just, when you take them together, so 1 and 1 equals 2, 1 and 2 equals 3, 2 and 3 equals 5, 3 and 5 equals 8, 5 and 8 equals 13. So you take the prior, prior number, you add it on to the number before it, and you end up with the next number in the sequence. And there's these ratios that this happens in nature all over the place. When you look at a way that a tree branches out, it branches out in a Fibonacci sequence. It's got one trunk. Seashells. Yep, seashells, sunflower seeds, our faces, our even like our extensions, you know, like two arms, two hands. Flower petals, yeah. pine cones. Yeah, it's all over the place. And we see the same thing in markets. There's lots of times it's, and it, it's never a guarantee. It's just there's a lot of times where you see price pause at a Fibonacci extension. 
And so here we are talking about tech has been the large cap tech has been the only name in town. And you have things like NVIDIA, semiconductors as a whole, semiconductors on a relative basis, reaching Fibonacci extensions. For example, NVIDIA reaching a 144.618 extension of its entire base that goes from 1999 to 2016. You have semiconductors using SMH re reaching a 2.618 extension of the 2022 through 2023 consolidation. SMH versus S&P, 1.618 extension from 2000 to 2023. Again, these are not guarantees. This is where price pauses, but it's a logical area. It's kind of like walking up to an intersection and you have to pause. You can't just cross the street that you might see a pause in the price action. The uptrend is still intact in all of these things. But wouldn't it be something that when NVIDIA is getting a bunch of press for having a split, I think you highlighted, Ian, there's a rebalancing that went on in XLK. Yeah, and I think I think that took place today. It's supposed to, I believe, takes place today, or is it next Friday? It's four quarter end. I'm looking at the, of course. Last, last, week, last week, you and Kevin talked about how Microsoft and Apple were each a little bit above 20% of XLK mm -hmm. and, and the video was about 6%. Because of where things were as of last Friday, this is now flipping around. It's going to be Microsoft and NVIDIA that are 20% or greater in XLK. And now Apple's dropping down to like 4%. Down to 4 or 5%. And it is happening... You have a time frame that you're looking at. Yeah, and I think they're so all the spider ETFs are getting rebalanced today. Okay. So it is happening. Yes, so it's it triggered happening today. It was triggered last Friday. It's now happening. So if you think about that, that's billions and billions of dollars worth of shares shifting for XLK from Apple to NVIDIA. And it's just interesting to know that this is taking place you might be shifting away from apple at just the wrong time so they're going to be selling 11 billion of apple and buying about 9.8 billion in nvidia i'm sure there's some that are listening to this who are like oh that's an edge it's not it's already it this is not new news by the time it gets here or has been in the news understand that this is old information that most certainly is priced in it's not like these type of things catch people by surprise, but from a narrative standpoint, it is interesting that NVIDIA has gotten a lot of press between its stock split, this rebalancing happening at a Fibonacci extension across the board, both from a sector perspective and an individual stock perspective. And, and we've talked for weeks now about the breadth deterioration that we've had, where it's been really narrow. We've been pivoted towards tech and semiconductors. I would describe this as similar in the sense of the table is set to October of 2023, when we talked about how there was such a big flush in the market and we got breath expansion after that, that the table was set for the, the bull market to just start, start up and start ripping. The table is set because the breath has been so bad. And now we're seeing all these things reach Fibonacci extensions. This is what it would look like when you start to see the rotation happen. It doesn't have to happen, but it will be interesting to pay attention to in the weeks weeks to come. <clears throat> yeah, I can tell you where I'm kind of leaning if I had to buy Apple or NVIDIA for the next six months. And maybe NVIDIA does great. I mean, golly, it certainly has had the rally of... Uh, oh, it's uh, been the leader, right? It's been the leader. Sure. No doubt about it. And there's, there's nothing Imagine suggesting. Imagine if you had bought NVIDIA on like January 4th, Dave. Or like even better, like 2X NVIDIA. <laughs> Wouldn't that be oh, wild? Wouldn't that be awesome? And you're just like, I, I mean, right? Because it's, it's January 4th. You don't know what's going to happen. Anything can happen. It's just breaking out. It's just literally just breaking out of a consolidation. No expectations. And then you happen to pick the right one. 
I mean, hey, it's good for the client. The clients like it, but it it could this could be a place where we see that pause. It, it doesn't have to trends. Well, the you know these prevalent factors that we see in markets, momentum and relative strength, and markets tend to trend. They are always in trend, but Nvidia continues an uptrend. But this would be a logical place to see some consolidation, similar to let's call it April. Yeah, where you see semiconductors move sideways. Maybe some of these other areas start to see some opportunity. You you know you mentioned small cap still in this range above a range that goes back. We've got you know bullish percent participation is very low. You know the percentage of stocks above their fifty day and two hundred day, you know has continued to deteriorate. Now it's a matter of do we see large caps catch down? Or do we see breadth expansion? Because we're back at 69% of the S&P 500 is above a 200-day moving average. 50% is above a 50-day moving average. And we had been early, you know, early to start the year, about 90% above a 50-day. So we've definitely pulled back the amount of stocks um, for the last three months. Definitely narrow breadth. So large caps could catch down, definitely possible, or you could see breath expansion here, but this is classic summer behavior. And I think we talk about this with clients every month in the newsletter, two big things, and they're still true today, or above 4,800 or above an upward sloping rising 200, like 200 right. day moving average, like those will remain and we'll get new we'll get a new 4800 in the future that we can really but i mean we're just five months off breaking yeah. all-time highs yeah yeah we had had a zero percent return you know you talked about january 4th yeah we were for a, three at, years. At that, yeah yep market didn't do anything and we're five months into what any, you know, and technician is going to tell you, yep, should be starting a new up leg. And when we say up leg, you know, or leg up, these are multi-month and multi-year, likely historically, again, we're looking at, you know, let's zoom out. And when you have two, three-year highs and we're only five months into it, still very bullish. It is. And, you know, you've always done a great job on here reminding people that November of last year is really not that far gone. Like, it's not that far away where we had these massive breath expansions. And then you look out 12 to 18 months in the future, the, the statistics on that is yeah. significant. And then we're all like, oh, my God, we're averaged up like 26 percent. And then we have like an April and, be, and people are like, oh, my God, oh, this is it. Like, no, no, it's not it. Like this was a small speed bump on like a wide open interstate. Right. I should well, I, mean, I, I don't want to get too bullish. Now I sound like any consolidation is a consolidation with an uptrend. You can look at industrials using XLI. You can look at materials using XLB. You can look at yeah. financials using XLF. While they are absolutely <laughs> I shouldn't even use that adjective. They are an opportunity cost on a relative basis, the S and P, meaning when you do that ratio analysis, they are have broken levels or in a downtrend on an absolute basis, just on their own, very quality consolidation. Very quality. I mean, you can't look at an XLF or XLI weekly chart and not tell me that that isn't the most, I mean, okay, let's take XLF for example. Is not this so after a off the October lows, we had a 35% run up, 35% into the May highs. Or, and we'll let's even call this, we'll take the March highs, a little less, maybe like 32%. And this is what we get a sideways consolidation so far. We get to work it off through time. Yeah. Instead of having some big correction, I will take that every day of the week. Yeah, lower volatility with the same potential for higher returns. 
yeah, yeah. Pr- corrections through time much more palatable for i would sure. much rather xlf do this than say we're going back to the 200 day right we're going to go down another 10 percent. it's annoying you got to sit through it but it's well, the it's, healthiest and it's an opportunity cost right all these things we mentioned when you compare them to the s p every dollar that you have an account it has an opportunity to go anywhere and if you owned xlf instead of the s p you paid that price it's down but on an absolute basis it's holding up very nicely and again the table is set we've definitely seen breath deterioration but it's almost within the normal context of an uptrend and what i mean by that is you know we love it when our football teams don't ever have to punt during a game but when you see a punt it doesn't mean the game is over or maybe you have three punts and you're just playing a field position game this happens in markets too where Stocks aren't always going up 100% of the time. There's times where they need to consolidate and reset, and we could be upon that period of time now while uncomfortable, right? It's super narrow. Like international stocks are off. It's not like small caps have done anything. All these areas that we just talked about have consolidated. They haven't moved higher. It's been, you know, 10 to 50 stocks over the last six to eight weeks. That can be uncomfortable. Hey, Ron Dane scored a lot of touchdowns, but he didn't score one on every drive, Dave. Right. I love that you brought he up good. He was good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But it's not, wow. I mean, just because you guys went three and out on some drive while you're still up 35 7 doesn't mean, oh, here the, the team's going to come back. The Bears are going to come back and win. Right. Exactly. Like it's that that's a great way to look at it is since the breath thrust in November, the market's 30% higher at the same time. It's early from the context of the larger picture of 2021 through now. And when you look out 18 months from an event like November, the stats show you're higher and stronger and you're going to have pullbacks like markets aren't without volatility. So this field position game shouldn't necessarily worry you. Now, if you start seeing your all-stars get injured and come off the floor, come off the field, that's another story. But right now we got yeah. Microsoft at all-time highs, Apple at all-time highs. Apple back below 198, back below 200 day. Okay, yeah, let's let's panic together. Right. But it's just it's not I mean Microsoft, yeah, all these just nothing plenty, in the I, I just don't see anything there. Plenty of large caps still holding things higher and some will say I know you guys highlighted last week that uh, large cap tech or, or that tech was 31 to 33 percent of the s p yeah which which if you look near term you know let's say the last 10 years that number seems extreme from a sector perspective but then you look back at a period like the 1950s and 1960s where guess what you saw rising rates we were at greater extremes from the really 50s. yeah yeah when you look at like the large cap names back then the nifty 50 their concentration, you know, some might call it the Meg 7 right now or the Meg 10, whatever you want to call it. That so what just, were people buying? What's that? What kind of stocks? Yeah, like what were they buying? You know, like Avon, uh, Chrysler. Avon. Yeah, like some the Nifty 50 from the 1950s and 60s. So not we're not talking not the Nifty, India. Not India. That era was oh, a rising see. rate environment. Some of these are still around. Coca-Cola. Yeah. And Coca-Cola's been good. So I yeah, you know if you bought like, after that, you probably would have still made a lot of money. Coca-Cola. A lot of these. Schlitz. You know, yeah. Brewery. Wasn't that isn't that a, a Milwaukee? That's a Milwaukee. That's a Milwaukee. Yeah. Milwaukee, but like Xerox, Bristol Myers, American Express, Johnson and Johnson. IBM, Eli okay. Lilly, N- <laughs> Eli Lilly N- still killing it. MTG is on here. Yeah, yeah. M- MGIC Investment, the mortgage. I had no soon. idea they've been around that long. General Electric, Pepsi, Pfizer, Philip Morris. Got to have your cigarettes. Mm-hmm. Cigarettes and soda. Texas Instruments. Walt Disney, Walmart. So, like, there was definitely a concentrated group of stocks. 
that did very well in the 1950s and 60s. And it wasn't until, so the 1970s consolidation, which was very similar to the 2000s consolidation in stocks, that consolidation was led by those 50. It's when these started to pull back and correct that you had this long-term sideways consolidation in stocks. So not unlike, you know, you've talked about in the past, the late 90s, Ian, like there was a concentration that took place in the late 90s where a certain group of stocks, tech stocks, e-commerce was what it was called back then, stocks were concentrated and you might call it bubble-like, but the bubble type features took years. You know, 1995, you know, that's a long time, 1995. When people talk about, oh my, right, you hear all the, I was in middle school when I guess the dot-com bubble was exploding, but you hear all these stories and if for, let's just say we're entering some type of similar environment. I personally don't want to sit there. I, I mean, I would just rather participate in it. I'm not saying that it's happening. I'd say I'd rather participate in it than sit there for two, three, five years and scoff and talk about, you know, people talk about NVIDIA at a $3 trillion. Well, what if it goes to $5 trillion and you just sat there on your little social media and scoffed about it and put out little memes instead of just participating, making money or making money for you and your clients and your family. I just much rather participate in it. And I feel like that's an environment that we're getting into. What do we talk about Cisco? People love to talk about Cisco. In 98, 99, we'll did a lot more before 98, 99. Right, correct. Yeah, and it just kept going. And then it was up another eight. I, I have no way. I have, I don't know where we're at in the cycle of things. I know we're above 4,800. I know that there's a pretty dang good chance that this continues. And based on not just recently, but off the 2022 lows, it has been a mega cap and large cap tech leadership. And I would say too, what's interesting about the current market environment, when you combine where tech is at along with the weak breath, if you haven't participated, you're in a really tough spot. You're in a super tough spot mentally because now you've definitely convinced yourself. I mean, who would get in now when the breath is horrible? Right. And then if you're... if you're you're thinking you're going to get short after we've had borderline three months of breath deterioration, like this is where you're going to get short. So not only is it a weird spot to consider getting really long, it's also a really dangerous spot to consider getting short. I mean, in in some ways, I would call it ridiculous, just because why would you short an uptrend? But there's a lot of people don't that don't use technical analysis; they use fundamentals, et cetera, or opinion. So the idea that you're going to get short here is incredible. And at the the same time, when you ask the question, is this where we want to put new money to work? That's also tough. I hopefully, you know, people have been participating. I know our clients have been, and we should be really open and excited about any type of consolidation we see here out of tech and even a broadening out of breath. Especially if it leads to three months of your average stock outperforming. So plenty of room to go to the upside. Also very logical place for there to be some rotation, meaning you see tech pause here, you see semiconductors pause, and you see a resurgence in things like energy, right? When we look at oil and we look at the dollar, like there's some things that are showing up there. Not that it has to be one-to-one, but the oil moving higher typically is coincident with energy stocks moving higher, which is the lowest cap, or maybe utilities are the lowest slice or smallest slice of the S&P 500, if you see that materialize, that will be interesting. Utilities. Remember when utilities were sending a warning because they're our performance? <laughs> Not so much. I Not mean, so much pe- other people will come up with. Yeah, they'll come up with any type of any type of reason. I mean, similar. I see the some type of 
you know, for lack of a better phrase, mean reversion out of a lot of these things, the relative charts. I mean, you can look, you mentioned industrials, financials. I can put discretionary on there. Yeah. I mean, I could see the rubber band snapping back here for the summer. But again, all of these, you know, I throw materials in there, all of these still downward sloping relative 200 days, you know, put healthcare in there. Yeah, the, the market is narrow right now, and that's how markets operate. Sometimes it's expansive, sometimes it's narrow. It's like a river, rivers rapid, and then they pool, and then they wrap it. It's the same thing happens in markets. Sometimes stocks are all moving in one direction. It's that type of season. You know, the salmon are spawning. I love all... those, trust me. Yeah, that's the best. Man. I love a heavily stocked river. Everything's mm-hmm. flowing. Everything's going. Your lures in the your lures in the water for ten seconds till something snatched it. <laughs> right. Yeah. You literally but reach in the water, and grab something. That is not what we have. No. It's just not. And I could even see. I mean, we tend to get these real. I mean, this could last till Q four. Right. I mean, really, over the last, when you think about it, Dave, and our, we've been trading together for five years at this point. And when have the strongest areas all come? Q4 2019. Yep. Q4 2020. Q4 2021. Mm-hmm. Q4 2022. Yep. Q4 2023. Right. That's when we see the the salmon show up. And, you know, over the, the ensuing three months, tech usually makes its way to the top. Like, but we get these bread thrusts and everyone gets excited October, November, and everything works. Sometimes a couple, you know, maybe in September. But, yeah, I mean, maybe that's that's the MO. You get your bread thrust in Q4 and then... Q1, 2, 3 of the following year is kind of this this mega cap tech thing. It's what we're seeing play out again this year. Because really, breath started dropping off in January. Correct. I mean, I can go back to advanced decline line. Bullish percent. A lot of this stuff, yeah, peaked January. When it's kind of like it's. It's one of those things where, like, we talk about that breath thrust from November. It's a lot like the start of a marathon race. Like, boom, all the runners are together. But as you're watching the race, there's a separation. But there's going to be a kick towards the end, too. And your point being Q4, things are setting up. Like, it doesn't. Ian's not guaranteeing it. I don't want to give that impression. But, like, we've had the breath deterioration. And now you're sitting at a, a point where Q4... Now we have a little ways to go yet before Q4. And so you could see this breath deterioration continue until that point. But it's also all the stuff that we're seeing matches that potential. Is that, I don't want to put words in your mouth. No, I think that that's exactly right. And, you know, we go back to this scenario of, of course, you got to preface it so people don't go crazy. But, like small caps. So if we go back to the late 2000s, small caps actually didn't do anything until like super, super, super late, like November 99. And we know that markets peaked in like March of 2000. So they go on this like crazy run at the very, very, very end of the cycle. And you know, that's just another thing that I, it's just a very plausible, we don't need Russell to, you know, how many stocks in the Russell are in the S&P? None, right. probably. Well, they're okay. I shouldn't say that without looking. But in theory, there should be, in my view, none. That's basically the case. Yeah. NASDAQ, how many are there? 100? Is every stock in the NASDAQ 100 in the S&P 500? Probably. Yeah, there's a pretty big overlap. About 50, about 50%. Okay. Wow. That's lower than I thought it would be. Are you using SPY and QQQ? 
I'm using SPY and QQQ. So there's 85 overlapping. Okay. I see. I see this. Yes. But, you know, to your point, you're just saying. Has much more influence. Yep. Has much more influence. The bigger keep getting bigger. You can like that. You cannot like that. But it's math. Like, I don't know what to tell people. Like, same thing with Fibonacci. It's just the way that that God created things. It's the way that that nature operates. I would argue it's why we like to create and be programmers as we're made in his image and those type of things. But same thing with math is compounding. It's something big that has a 1% move. That 1% is going to be larger than something small. That's just the way it is. I don't know what to tell people, but this condition that we're in currently could last all summer. And it just is what it is. I've never once... And if someone's had a different experience, please find my email, hit me up on DMs. But I've never once gotten to pick the hand I was dealt. <laughs> nope. Nope. This is just the. It doesn't operate that way. Yeah. This not is that just I, a... Not that we should call. That's bad. I shouldn't call the market a casino because I get frustrated when people do that. Yeah. No. If you don't use charts, if you don't use technical analysis, I can definitely feel that way. Yeah. And technical yeah. analysis isn't, isn't a guarantee. But it does provide information and an edge because you can visualize and see where supply and demand are interacting. Like imagine yeah. driving down a street and all, you, all the information you get is, okay, you've got a dotted line on your right, a solid line on your left. You have 10 cars in front of you and the speed limit sign says 55, right? You've given me all the fundamental information and you don't give me my eyes to see other things like brake lights and speed of traffic. That would be nuts. Like, you can be a fundamentalist all you want, but to me, you're driving blind. Technical analysis, you get to see it all. You get to see the interaction of all those opinions happening. I can't imagine not using it. Well, I think it's something that I think T, like TA is, it's sound like it's got to click for you. Like, it's got, I think for some people, and it's totally fine. I mean, there's clearly been people that have, made a lot of money on deep value investing or whatever their path of choice is in the, to the markets. But for me, and it's, it goes back to when I discovered, I mean, someone pulling up a chart, drawing one horizontal line across and then saying, well, this asset can't go higher until we break through this level where we've been rejected multiple times. And that just instantly, that made so much sense to me. Can't go to 86 if you never break 85. Right. That's literally yeah. impossible. Right. And if 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 price keeps going to 85 and then reversing down, what does that tell us? There's sellers there. Yeah. So you're literally watching the interaction of supply and demand happen in real time. And you're right. You can't get to 86 without going through 85. You can't get to 87 without going through 86. Or the concept of momentum, right? And now if, if you pulled up, a bunch of 40, 50, 80 year charts of assets, S&P, Dow, stocks, and they moved, you know, in a in a sideways pattern. Let's say the S&P was basically flat over the last 100 years. Okay, maybe I'd, or, you know, most stocks were f- flat when you pulled up their chart. I'd say, okay, maybe m- momentum isn't really a thing. I mean, you can't argue with the data. Right. Things that are going higher tend to go higher. Things that are going lower tend to go lower. It's so true. Yeah. And it and I'm so thankful. You know, I'm so thankful that we have momentum, that we have charts that we can use technical, you know, analysis to identify these things. And I, if I may be so blunt and bold, this is a great time to highlight the support of this podcast, Adaptive Select ETF, which is listed on the New York Stock Exchange under ticker ADPV which helps investors access two of the most prevalent factors in markets, momentum and relative strength. Through proprietary identification methods, the Adaptive Select ETF attempts to own the strongest 25 large cap stocks when the market is in an uptrend. And since not all market environments are the same, Adaptive Select seeks to prevent extended declines by moving to short-term treasury bills and cash during long-term market downtrends. Investors can find out more, including how to invest in ADPV by visiting adpvetf.com 
or calling 1-833-880-5200. Investing involves risk, including possible loss of principal. ADPB is distributed by Quasar Distributors, LLC. So thanks for letting me interrupt a little bit there. Ian, That's great. I, I know that we're you know, pretty passionate about technical analysis just because of its its ability to show us where the interaction of supply and demand from the past is important for the future, or for current times, uh, momentum calculations, uh, those type of things, and what we continue to see. I know, I know, on this episode, we got to close it down here pretty soon. We really didn't talk much about bonds. We didn't talk much about international stocks. Not much international, about international. Yeah, getting they were looking good. Yeah. And I think I saw VGK as of today. It's an ETF that represents Europe. And we talked about Europe for a few weeks. I mean, and there were definitely some outliers setting up very well. The VGK, all-time relative lows. Yeah. I mean, very definition of a relative downtrend. It's why we don't just create portfolios uh, and buy and hold them forever. We use relative strength to identify where to be and where not to be. Our clients are familiar that they have zero exposure at this time to international. There will be a time where they do. Uh, at this time, they don't. That's not a recommendation to those listening. It's just our usage of relative strength. Uh, same thing with, you know, we're seeing dollar strength. That makes sense. What you base, basically what you just said about international stocks weakening, we're seeing a strengthening dollar. And interestingly enough, a highly correlated uh, energy commodity oil matching that dollar strength. Not something you see every day necessarily, but that's what we currently see now. And we didn't even touch on Bitcoin. Bitcoin, yeah, still big picture, still consolidating down today. Didn't have a great week, not really having a great month, but big range up here. I beta well, asset. Just, we got a big rate. I mean, it's like anything else we talked about. It's a consolidate consolidating on top of these highs. Yeah. I was just gonna bring that up that it's consolidating. It's an opportunity cost on a relative basis, but on an absolute basis, perfectly normal to consolidate like this, right? Yeah. And man, yeah. will it throw people for a loop when we come out of these consolidations in the direction of the primary trend? Doesn't have to happen. That would be a clue if we don't. But if these consolidations all resolve to the upside, man. It's going to be a big major move on Bitcoin, I'll tell you that. Yes, it will. Pretty large. So with that, Ian, we've kind of we've reached the end of our time. Anything else you want to highlight before we wrap it up and ask our listeners to give us a high ranking? There's not, yeah. Uh, strong dollar foreign stocks have fallen apart, but the S&P and the NASDAQ keep trucking. That's the game. I would say great summary, right? U.S. It remains U.S. large cap for the foreseeable future until we see breath expansion. We haven't seen that yet. Could happen. We just have to wait for that. And sometimes waiting is the hardest part. Uh, some commodities showing up and Bitcoin falling off, and that's okay. But with that, Ian, I, I hope all our listeners uh, appreciate this information and you share it with your friends and family and you give us high rankings on whatever platform that you like to use. Uh, we really appreciate it. Thanks for being on here again with me, Ian. Have a great weekend, everyone.